All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Media Ghazi Zadeh. Uh, I'm one of the maintainers for Minikube. I'm a technical lead manager at Google, and I have the honor of being leading the Minikube team for the past few years, past two and a half years. And then here in this talk, I want to share with you an overview of the maintaining Minikube in the past five years. And also, I'm going to share 20 pro tips of using Minikube and also some lessons we have learned in maintaining an open source project. I also have with me Anders Birkland uh, from Göteborg, Sweden. He's online. Uh, he'll be joining us in spirit and online on Slack chat. Uh, you can follow me on GitHub or Twitter. I, I don't have that many followers, but uh, I will only speak about Minikube and coding in this Twitter media, media dev. Uh, I'm curious by the show of hands, who has used Minikube here? Okay, that is almost everybody. And another question, who has known or used Kubernetes more than five years? Almost nobody. So I think Minikube is older than all of us, <laughs> including myself in using Kubernetes. I myself did not uh, uh, use Minikube. Um, I first used Minikube about four years ago. So I think when Minikube was started, I did not even know about Kubernetes at that time. The previous maintainers for Minikube, uh, Dan Lawrence started it, and then Thomas Thunberg and Matt Rickert. Uh, but the current maintainers of Minikube, the people behind the Minikube emojis are these amazing people, under Sharif al Gamal, uh, Stephen Powell, and Predrag Rogovic. And we are uh, from diverse set of uh, countries and companies. And, uh, we have three Googlers and uh, uh, two non-Googlers uh, in Europe, Asia, South America, uh, and North America and the Middle East. So we are, these are the uh, emojis behind, uh, the faces behind, the names behind the emojis. Here are some interesting stats about Minikube. Minikube has more than 685 contributors, which 16 of them have contributed more than 100 commits, like a very active commit uh, developers. We have about 3 million GitHub downloads, which does not include our main method of downloading, which is GCS buckets, but it's still an amazing number of downloads. Uh, we have a 90% CSAT score, according to our surveys. And we have had 125 releases in the past five years. 125 times people released Minikube. That's really amazing to me. Uh, this is a, a graph of uh, lines of code uh, of Minikube in the past five years. We have 1.6 million lines of code for this project, uh, which is amazing. That includes the vendor. If you do not count the vendor, it's about 558,000 the lines of code for Minikube. Uh, and by the way, the, this method that we ch uh, chose to uh, count the line of code, it does not include the comments and does not include the, the docs. It only includes only the Go code that we have written for Minikube. Um, an overview of Minikube, something which is unique about Minikube that no other local Kubernetes tool could claim that is a diverse set of uh, technologies that you could uh, use to start a local Kubernetes on your laptop. So whether you are a person who uses Docker, or if you are a person who uses KVM, or if you are using VMware or Parallels, or even if you don't want to use any virtualization technology, you just want a bare metal non-driver, we have all kinds of solutions for you. Uh, so Minikube is not bound to a specific driver. It's, it's all kind of virtualization technologies that could, you could have. The most inclusive uh, local Kubernetes experience you could have. And also we have support for different operating systems and uh, different CPU architectures. ARM64 is getting very popular recently. And um, Minikube is also the only, only local Kubernetes experience that allows you to set a runtime. I'll talk about the difference of the runtime and a driver in the next slide. But majority of the uh, local Kubernetes out there that you know who are similar to Minikube, they only have container D runtime. Minikube allows you to set the runtime. It could be cryo, Docker, or container D. Minikube also supports CNIs. You can, you can specify CNI you want. Uh, 
I don't know if you guys saw the, the security talks on Cilium. Liz Rice had a very amazing uh, talk on, and she was using Cilium. Uh, I was very tempted to replicate her demo using Minikube, but and you could possible because Minikube, you could just easily specify your, your CNI. Uh, by the way, the green ones are the ones that we test them and the green ones are the ones that we do not have an integration test for them. Uh, what is a driver in Minikube? Drivers are this column. Uh, basically, if you want to install Kubernetes, you need a Linux, you need a Linux box. So somebody has to give you a Linux box, either a Docker container or a VM, or basically a remote machine, like a SSH or a bare metal. So that's the driver, they call that a driver in Minikube. Whoever provides you that Linux uh, box that you can install Kubernetes on it. So you can, in Minikube, start the driver with whatever driver you want. And if you don't specify it, Minikube will automatically select the best driver for you based on your system health and what you have installed. And what is a container runtime? So in this picture, container runtime is at least three ones. Container runtimes is the engine that Kubernetes itself uses to manage the life cycle of the containers inside a pod. So this is the container runtime inside Minikube. It has nothing to do with the driver. So this, these two get confused a lot by the people who use Minikube, and I wanted to just in this uh, talk make, make it clear for everybody so we never have this confusion again. So the driver is the outer Linux box that uh, you, you, you get the Linux box, and container runtime is the runtime that Kubernetes uses to create pods for you. So the, the pink one is your, your driver, and then there will be Minikube's Linux box is the driver, and then inside of that, there will be container runtime. That could be cryo, containerd, or docker. The confusing part is the driver could also be docker. So you could have a docker with a docker runtime, or you could have a docker or a containerd runtime. So that's most of the confusing part. But I hope this slide uh, clears the confusions once forever. But here's even more confusing things from a Docker. Docker has so many news in the, uh, in the past few months or past year, and Kubernetes has so many news on Docker past year. Uh, in, uh, recently, uh, in December 8, 2020, Kubernetes says we are deprecating Docker. I, and people like freaked out. It's like, what does that mean? And so this is about the runtime. It's not about the driver. So you could still have the Docker driver with a container D runtime. So, but what does that really mean? Does that mean you can never, you can no longer have a Docker runtime anymore? No, it means that Kubernetes no longer wants to maintain the code that allowed translating Docker shim to a CRI interface, CRI interface. However, there is possible to still have container D, sorry, a Docker runtime. And Minikube chose to continue supporting Docker runtime, not the driver. Why? Uh, this graph shows uh, Minikube's, Minikube's main uh, users are local Kubernetes developers, the people who build an image and they deploy it to their cluster. And we have different ways to build an image. For example, in kind or K3D, there is a command called kind image load or K3D image load. Minikube has eight different ways to build the image. One of them is called Docker Env. And you could see the Minikube's Docker Env is the fastest way to build images on the cluster. The blue one is the Minikube's Docker Env, and the orange one is MicroKate, and green one is K3D, and the yellow one is Kind. And the, the, the lower, the better the number. So Minikube has committed to continue supporting the Docker runtime because it's significantly faster for the local developers. Uh, and thus, when you build an image, you change an iteration on it, and you want to build another time, and you want to save time on that. So Minikube is five years old. I, I was in the conference. I was talking to people. I, I heard a lot of misconceptions, and I hear, hear them in uh, misperceptions, and I heard them before in the surveys that we, we collect from the users. Uh, and I want to go over the top misperceptions in Mini, about Minikube. Uh, it is true that three years ago, Minikube was very slow. In fact, it was so slow, it was taking about three minutes to get started. Uh, we changed that two years ago. We introduced the new drivers. We refactored a lot. We 
we introduced preload. I, I gave a talk on that in the previous KubeCon, how we made Minikube faster. But people still think Minikube is slower because when they compare Minikube with others, they compare the VM drivers with, let's say, K3D's Docker driver. So if you want to compare these two, you want to compare Minikube's Docker driver with, let's say, K3D's Docker driver. And another misconception is Minikube by default waits for the Kubernetes cluster to be healthy. If you say Minikube start, by default, we wait for API server to be up and running, etcd to be up and running, uh, and that core DNS to be answering the DNS. If you don't want to wait for that, you can say Minikube wait false, and it will be exiting as fast as others. But these are all like not very good ways to claim if Minikube is slow or fast. So we built a tool called time to cates And what this tool does is measures how a local Kubernetes tool, regardless of what it be, uh, performs. And we collect different metrics, like when the tool itself claims I'm done, let's say Minikube start or kind create cluster create or K3D cluster create, when they claim they are done, that's the first metric we measure. And then when the Kubernetes API server is answering, and then we deploy an app and we measure when the app is actually running on it, and then when the DNS is answering, and also we measure the CPU. Uh, past two years, Minikube went from two minutes and 35 seconds to 21 seconds. And here's a chart that we generate automatically in GitHub Actions per release. So this, you could see Minikube against uh, Kind and K3D. Uh, so we're significantly faster than Kind. We are not as fast as K3D. K3D is beating us. And uh, K3D uh, is, has an advantage. They're not using the etcd. They're using the SQL Lite for, for the database, uh, which is a kind of, you could say, a fork of Kubernetes, because Kubernetes, the real Kubernetes uses etcd. It doesn't use SQL Lite. So that significantly makes it faster. So this is the data. And, and uh, the mis misconception that Minikube is slow. So by data, you could prove it that it's, it's a misperception. The second misconception, uh, misperception is high CPU usage. It's true. Minikube used to be extremely intensive on CPU three years ago. And we significantly cut down on the, on the CPU usage. Uh, actually, you can uh, check out the talk by Priya Wadua, improving performance of your Kubernetes cluster in KubeCon 2020. And she goes over how we did that in a lengthy talk. And we measured the CPU usage again. So the first one is your OS idle. And the second one is Minikube HyperKit driver. And third one is Minikube VirtualBox. And you could see Minikube has lowest CPU usage against Kind and K3D and Docker Desktop. Uh, so this is another misperception that it was true three years ago about Minikube, but no longer. Another misconception is like Minikube is not a real Kubernetes cluster. I see this a lot in the surveys. Uh, the survey says, I wish uh, Minikube was a real Kubernetes cluster, but it really is. We actually passing Kate's conformance test. I have put the link to that. We pass a production Kate's conformance test. We do, not, we do not recommend using Minikube in production, but we do pass all the conformance tests. And also, you could actually configure every component of Kubernetes in Minikube. There is a flag called extra config. So you could pass basically any argument to kubelet, kubeadm, etcd, basically any Kubernetes component out there, you could configure it using Minikube start extra config. So you could actually do any sort of configuration, real world configuration, advanced configuration in your uh, Kubernetes. So don't think of Minikube as a toy. It's actually a real Kubernetes inside a Linux box. Uh, another thing I hear a lot is like, I wish Minikube had multi-node. We delivered this feature two years ago. Uh, and not people, many people know about it, but you could actually start Minikube with multi-nodes very easily. You just say Minikube start dash n2, 
and multi-node. Or if you already have a cluster, you just want to add another node, you can just say Minikube node add. Uh, that would be another way to that. Another one that uh, is out there is like Minikube cannot be multi-cluster. Uh, and, and, and this is not true as well. You can create a separate cluster with dash P. That's a little bit unfortunate that we chose the name profile five years ago for a cluster. That, that is the source of the confusion. So if you want to create a second Minikube cluster, we call it unfortunately P, but we have stuck with that uh, because of backward compatibility. Uh, you could just say Minikube start dash P, P1, Minikube start dash P, P2. And you could actually configure them differently. You could say the second cluster I want it with container D and the third cluster I want it with cryo or different drivers and different, even different Kubernetes version. Um, you could actually say start Minikube with a different Kubernetes version. I actually missed to mention one of the misperceptions uh, and that is people think you have to install the latest version of Minikube for the latest Kubernetes version. Or if you want an older Kubernetes version, they think they should go install older Minikube version. But that's not true also. You, you could just do Minikube start dash dash Kubernetes version and pick a very old version to emulate what you have in production. Another misconception is not good for CI. So that motivated me to create a new org called Minikube CI. Uh, and this actually is a real world example with uh, a GitOps model that has example of Minikube in all of these clouds, in Prow, Google Cloud Build, GitHub Action, Azure Pipeline, Travis CI, Circle CI, and GitLab. Minikube is really well uh, suited to be used in the CI, especially with the non-driver, which does not need any virtualization at all. It's just straight on the, on the CI machine that you have. So, but if you want to see an example of using Minikube in any of the CI, you can check out this work. Now I want to go over 20 uh, pro tips for Minikube. Uh, I will go over them very quickly, and I apologize for speaking fast. And I know it's the last talk of the day, so um, you're probably running out of caffeine, everybody, including myself. But I'll go over these uh, 20 tips that I've gathered that I have not actually seen many users use that, but it's possible. You could copy a file into Minikube using Minikube CP command. It's pretty neat. And actually, you can copy between Minikube nodes. It's like the second one is an example of multi-node. You're copying a file called ATXT to um, the second node of a multi-node cluster, and you say which directory you want to copy that file up to. For more information, you can check out the documentation. Uh, there's another way to copy files to Minikube. And, and this one is very hidden. We don't, we don't talk about it that much. And the Minikube home folder is in your home folder dot Minikube. There is a folder called files. Anything you put there will actually be copied to Minikube on, on every Minikube start. This one requires a Minikube start, but uh, you, that's why you have to run Minikube start one more time to get this affected. Um, another thing I have seen people not use this feature at all is like uh, CNI. They're not even aware of it. And uh, you could uh, uh, try, let's say, Minikube with Cilium CNI using Minikube start. Or if there's a CNI out there that we do not support it yet, we support five, six of them. You could pass the YAML file pass to the CNI, and it will just uh, install that CNI. And, and we do the CNI in a, a specific order that uh, the core DNS will be configured correctly. Uh, this is another one, uh, specifying a different container runtime, Minikube start container runtime cryo. One caveat to this, if you want to use cryo, you want to use Minikube Podman env instead of Minikube Docker env, because Cryo goes well with Podman. Uh, and, and if you want to build an image against Cryo, you could use Podman. Another one is Minikube add-on list. You, we have uh, tens of add-ons, and then some of them are maintained by Google, some of them are by third parties, some of them by Kubernetes. 
you can give them a try. But this is an interesting one. Let's say any of these add-ons, you want to you want to use a different image for it. Let's say you don't want to wait for Minikube to install to bump the Helm Helm's image. Uh, you could just say Mini sorry, you could say Minikube add-ons enable dash dash images and then provide the image that you want to override to that add-on. Uh, this is a uh, this is an interesting tip for, for myself. There's another uh, trick that you could use. If Minikube has uh, flags called memory and CPU that you could specify the memory and CPU, you could actually pass the word max and it will use the maximum CPU and maximum memory that you could possibly get out of your system. By default, Minikube tries to get a sane amount of memory and CPU based on what your system is. We auto select it. The better system you have, they will get a better chunk of it up to a maximum. There's another flag, minikube dash dash user. Uh, I love this flag. Uh, we, ha we, are, we have started collecting, um, uh, uh, writing an audit JSON to minikube logs. And if you actually run minikube logs, you'll see audit table. You see what user ran what command on minikube at what time and how long it took. Uh, this dash dash user flag is amazing if you are sharing a cluster with different tools. If you have a few tools that they're all sharing the Minikube cluster, you could see who started the cluster, who stopped it, who deleted it, who upgraded the Kubernetes version of it, who applied a different CNI on it. So you can see the, the flow of the work. So if you are sharing a cluster, I strongly suggest adding the dash dash user to all of the commands that you use for Minikube. Minikube start, stop, anything really. That would be uh, helping with the auditing later. We have a new trick for Minikube logs. In old times when something was wrong in Minikube, uh, if you had talked to us in GitHub issues, we would ask you to give us this file, that file, this log, this log, this one, this one. It was five, six different things you had to paste for us or find for us. No longer is that the case. You just, if you run this command, Minikube logs, dash dash file, and what, whatever file name you want, it will collect all the different logs from different places, uh, from different inside and outside Minikube and they'll put it all in one file. This is an interesting uh, way to like, create a GitHub issue. Uh, then another pro tip that I want you guys to try it if you want to be a pro Minikube user, there's eight ways of building images with Minikube and it's on a website. So give it a try. Uh, there's a, another tool that I think many people do not know about it. It's called Minikube kubectl command. So if you have not installed kubectl, you could actually use Minikube's kubectl. You could say Minikube kubectl dash dash get pods. You do not have to install kubectl. But there's another trick that I was amazed by the contributor who contributed to Minikube. I was, I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. If you actually rename the Minikube's binary and call it kubectl, the Minikube binary will no longer act like Minikube binary. It will act like kubectl. So this is like an interesting thing because you do not need to download both Minikube and kubectl anymore. You can just download Minikube, rename it, call it kubectl. It will be kubectl. Um, so another trick, another pro tip. Uh, another pro feature, I'm curious, anybody ever used Minikube pause by show of hands? Nobody, okay. This is a very cool feature that nobody has used. Uh, so you can actually, when we were doing a lot of analysis of what taking Minikube's uh, CPU usage, API server of Kubernetes is a beast. It takes CPU. Uh, and do you need Kubernetes API server if you're a local developer? Do you? You need it sometimes. You need it when you apply, uh, you need it when you apply your YAML file, but after that you don't need it. Your apps is running. If you pause the Kubernetes API server, your apps will still be running in the pods. So pause Minikube whenever you, whenever you don't want it. It will pause only the Kubernetes API server. Your apps will be still running. It will save a lot of battery. If you're in a coffee shop, you don't have a charger. Minikube pause, but still your app will be running inside the Kubernetes cluster. We even have something better called auto pause. In the previous one, if you pause it and you want to apply another uh, app to your Kubernetes cluster, you had to do Minikube on pause. What if Minikube would do that for you? Like each time you apply a new YAML file, it will unpause itself 
And each time that you're not using the cluster, it will pause itself. We have an add-on called AutoPause. This is a dummy diagram that I draw really, I'm not very proud of what I draw, sorry, but this is how it works. Is that we have a transparent reverse proxy uh, that takes care of uh, uh, auto-pausing Minikube. But if you want to give this a try, Minikube add-ons enable auto-pause, a pro tip. Another pro tip, we have a new driver that I'm pretty sure nobody used this, SSH driver. Anybody used SSH driver? Okay, half of a hand went up, but it went down immediately, okay. Uh, so this is a way you can install uh, Kubernetes on a remote SSH. Or if you have a, access to a remote machine, you could say, install Minikube on that remote machine for me. All you have to do is just give us the IP. You'll go SSH into that. Uh, of course, you should have SSH access to it. And then we'll bootstrap a Kubernetes inside there for you. Another pro tip, you can, you can SSH to the Minikube cluster itself using Minikube SSH command. And if you want to only run one command and be done with it, not go inside, Minikube SSH dash dash, whatever the command it is. Let's say PWD. This is another one. Um, uh, you would be surprised that this is one of the uh, features that people asked us to implement. And this is called Schedule Stop. What does it do? Uh, if you say Minikube Stop, schedule five minutes, Minikube will stop itself in five minutes. Why people asked for this? Well, people use Minikube in embedded uses, like in IDEs. So some people, let's say, close their IDE, but they don't want to wait for it, they force kill it. And that don't give the IDE to stop Minikube, it's enough time for a stop Minikube. So this basically says, if I don't hear anything from you, I'll stop myself in five minutes. So in that use case, the IDE was every three minutes was scheduling another Minikube stop for five minutes, so it was basically refreshing it. So this is a way to uh, schedule Minikube or stuff. Another uh, new feature of Minikube that people probably don't know about it is output JSON. So you can actually make Minikube talk to you in JSON instead of in emojis and text. And this is also used for, for embedded use. Um, and it's the, the, the format for the JSON is actually the standard CNCF cloud event formats. The mount command, if you want to be a pro user, try the mount command. What is mount com command good for? Mount command is good for if you want to have persistent data outside Minikube. So if you want to delete your Minikube cluster, but you want to keep the, the pods data somewhere on your own machine, you can mount a folder from your Mac or your Windows into the pod, and then you will have real persistent data. I, this is a pretty uh, nifty feature, uh, but I have not seen people use it that much because I don't see that I, sometimes I see GitHub issues on them, but. Um, corporate certs, this is an important one because I get, a lot, get it a lot. So a lot of us work for corporations and corporations have their certs, right? Uh, who here has corporate certs in their company? Yeah, a lot of us. Yeah, and corporate certs are very annoying because you want to curl Google, it does not curl Google because, oh, I need the cert. So how do you add uh, your corporate cert to Minikube cert? So basically you copy it to this, this folder and Minikube will take care of it. Uh, basically we, we wanna copy it to this folder and then run Minikube start one more time. So Minikube copies those certs into the chain of the certs and Kubernetes can talk to the outside world using your corporate certs. Another uh, tip, we have two more tips left and I am running out of time. Um, the GCP auth is a new add-on that we have uh, you know, in old times when you had to, let's say your, your laptop is authenticated to GCP and your pod wants to be authenticated to GCP, you had to create this secret, apply the secret. Oh, it's, it was a, such a pain. Uh, so we developed this add-on called GCP Auth that uh, automatically gets the credentials from your laptop and puts it to every pod inside your cluster. Uh, that they will, so they will automatically have access to GCP, just like your own laptop has. And uh, there's another pro tip, if you do not want a specific pod to get that secret, just apply this label to it, GCP auth skip secret, and it will not get the secret. And there's a link for more information on it. Another pro tip, 
We have two more left. Uh, delete on failure. So Minikube uh, philosophy from the beginning has been be backward compatible and do not delete people's data. So if you start Minikube and we crash halfway, a lot of the times deleting Minikube and starting it again just works. Uh, sometimes it's just a virtual stitch in Hyper-V gets stuck, something, in, something gets stuck, and just deleting it works. If you want Minikube, allow Minikube to delete it on itself and try again, you can just say Minikube delete on failure, and then Minikube delete itself and try again on a failure. But by default, we'll not do that because we want to respect your, your, your cluster if you don't want to delete it. If you, maybe you have something interesting in there. Try our load balancer is another pro tip. Uh, Minikube, I think, is one of the only um, uh, uh, local Kubernetes that has direct IP access to the load balancer in the VM drivers, not in Docker drivers. Because Docker has its own limitation. And very, uh, many more. Uh, we have three interesting links, Minikube Tutorials, Minikube Handbook, and Minikube FAQ. Check them out. Now back to Docker. Docker has had so much news past year, okay? Um, the, the recent news is they are gonna be a paid tool for non-Linux operating systems, and, but they will be free and open for the Linux and open source users. And there's some blog posts on that uh, you can read. Uh, this is, I took a screenshot of the Minikube surveys uh, before I come to the KubeCon. Uh, so it's like, why you use Minikube? It's like Docker desktop going away, looking for a Docker desktop alternative. Because I didn't want to be tied to Docker desktop bundle, especially they were forcing updates. Uh, I need OSS alternative for Docker desktop as a replacement for Docker desktop. This is like people are flooding us with messages on can you be a replacement for Docker desktop? Uh, I mean, we are, we are a local development Kubernetes tool. We are not meant for that, but we can be. So this is how there are two ways to use Minikube as a Docker desktop replacement. Uh, one is using the Docker env method. What does that mean? You can install Docker CLI you can, using brew or whatever, but do not install the Docker desktop or quit Docker desktop or exit it. Um, and then use the Minikube Docker Env. If you eval the Minikube Docker Env, your terminal will be pointing to the Docker inside Minikube. And Minikube is a Linux box, which is, means it's always gonna be free as Docker claims. Uh, so, and then your Docker CLI, if you do Docker PS or Docker build, it's actually talking to the Minikube's Docker. It's no longer talking to the Docker desktop, or there is no Docker desktop in this case. So you could easily actually replace Docker desktop with Minikube. There's one method one. There's a second method. Uh, we introduced a new uh, command in Minikube called Minikube image build, uh, 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 Minikube image, which has many, many subcommands like image build, image load, image delete, image list. There are many subcommands for a Minikube image command. But you could basically build your images using Minikube without Docker at all. You do not even need to have Docker CLI installed. You could just say Minikube image build dash T and then pass to your Docker file. Basically the same syntax with Docker build. Um, and underneath we are using build kit uh, and so your image will be inside Minikube. Uh, this is like a more, uh, Minikube native method. The other one is like you're pointing to the, mini, the Docker inside Minikube, which either way it works. So there are two methods. Uh, a lot of people ask, and I hope in this conference, I answered all of these users' uh, questions with these two methods. And if I didn't answer it correctly, hit me up on Slack. I'll make a better, uh, a more clear instruction. Um, there are some lessons I've learned uh, in, in Minikube in the past uh, three years of being a maintainer. Uh, we have worked with hundreds of contributors. We have had uh, 675 uh, contributors, and many of them are very active. Uh, some of, uh, some of, there was a time that I was looking at the metrics there are more new contributors to Minikube than Kubernetes, and there are more active developers to Minikube than Kubernetes itself. And, and uh, this was based on the culture that people before me 
built it and I tried to pres preserve it. And like, uh, Thomas Stromberg did a great job in, in doing this and I followed his, his lead. Uh, like being inclusive in action. Like Minikube tries to be as inclusive as possible. We try to have support different languages and we try to uh, have our GitHub issues welcoming so people can talk to us. And we, have, we are in a very unique place that a lot of people who try Kubernetes, they come to Minikube for the first time. Some of them are not very technical, but they are very interested to be technical. So it's like a very interesting energy. Uh, another thing that I learned in this past few years was recognizing the contributors. And we developed actually tools to recognize the people who do any sort of contribution, even triage, helping in GitHub issues, responding that. And then I'll show you an example of that. And another one is like scheduling short one-on-one -on -one meetings with the contributors helped a lot in energizing this, this amazing uh, Kubernetes and also inviting to the Minikube exclusive meetings. We have two Minikube exclusive meetings. It's inviting you guys to, to that it has been a big part of our community uh, management. Um, here is uh, one of the tools that we developed called Pool Sheet. Uh, basically, each time we release Minikube in the release notes, we put a link to the charts and, and who did what sort of help in what category in Minikube. So even if you're not a technical person, but you want to answer people's questions, you get your name uh, recognized in this leaderboard. It's going to be on Minikube website forever. So we try to recognize the contributions. Uh, another maintainer lesson that I have learned uh, is embracing the human part of the softwares. Uh, this, this slide was very important for me, and I wish my talk was titled differently, so I could have dedicated the whole talk to this. I'm so passionate about this one, but I could only fit it in one slide and go over it very quickly. Uh, what I've learned that some of the stereotypes about software engineers might be not too wrong. There's, there's some, uh, our profession attracts different uh, type of personality and no, very neurodiverse personalities, people with OCPD, ADHD, cluster C. And working with these people, learning them un unleashes the power of, of maintaining a big project. Uh, if you learn that some people get obsessed on something and they cannot let it go, that person could be amazing if you want order in 1.5 million lines of code. But you also want to learn what is the strong part of this person, what is the weakness of this person. Or another type of person, he might miss out at paying attention to the biggest thing, but has the most creative mind. And you also need that type of person. Or you have the cluster C type of person who worries all the time. If you want to implement anything, worries all the time about the security implications of this. And the art of it is how we balance all of this. What is the budget that we have? What is the budget for security? What is the budget for creativity? And what is the budget for order? It takes, um, I wish I could have more time to talk about this. There's other talks in KubeCon that they talked, a lot, they touched this topic a lot, but I really learned a lot in the past three years that learning the humans around you goes a long way to, to to maintain a healthy project. Uh, and once you learn your humans, once you learn your contributors, you know what type of help they might need. Some need assurance, some need keeping on track, some need uh, uh, getting started. Uh, another th lesson that I learned is don't take anyone for granted. Some people come to this open source project to take a break from their day jobs. The worst thing you could do to them is like take them for granted that you're, yeah, you're supposed to do this. Like you, that's your thing. The, uh, not taking anyone for granted also is a lesson that I've learned. And also another uh, lesson is like do not burn out. This is another lesson that uh, I have seen a lot of people in open source, they come work really hard for two years and they, they burn out. There is a actually good talk in this talk, this KubeCon, I schedule, I, I, uh, I recommend watching it on YouTube. Uh, check out The Vulnerable Tale of Burnout by Julia Simon. 
This, this is the important lesson that I learned in the past three years of being in Minikube. Uh, another lesson that uh, as a Minikube maintainer I learned was like learning when to say no. And that was very essential for this old big project to keep going. One is the spam contributions. I don't know if you guys have seen any spam contributions. People literally write bots to make contributions to projects. Another thing to say no to is a promotion dr driven development. There was an amazing uh, Twitter discussion, promotion driven development. People write code just to get promoted and you could just smell it. And, and it's, it ruins a project's future. It, um, I, and I have learned to say no to that. Another thing to say no to that is hard to maintain code. Codes were like harder to maintain. The code does amazing things, but makes the project so complex that only that person could uh, maintain that. Of course, do not emerge or accept any contribution you do not fully understand. There's some special interest people I've seen that people with some special interest come to your project. They want to try to get this into their uh, project. It's another place to say no. Another place uh, to say no is potential security liability. I've seen a few times people wanted me to add a feature that I saw potential security vulnerability. Like I said, this is a third party image in this code. Who? can guarantee in the next five years this image is gonna have the same integrity as, as today. Like this, this project has been five years old, people have trust in it. So this is another place to say hard no, even though it adds a feature. And also another place to has a hard no is when somebody adds a new feature without integration test, hard no. This is amazing lessons I've learned by mistakes or by, from others. Another thing um, that I've learned is guarding against your own bias. Uh, unconscious bias is unconscious. It means you don't know you have it. And there's like at least seven of them that I strongly recommend. Take a Wikipedia page and read about it and then uh, and put that in your mindset. Uh, Another uh, main third lesson is like GitHub issues is a, an amazing source of information for future work and improvements. When I look at the GitHub issues, I see that the place that I learn from the users and when I am doing PR reviews is where the users learn from me. So there are two way communications, but GitHub issue is where I am supposed to learn from the users. And for that reason, we actually developed a tool to triage the GitHub issues, and it's called Triage Party. It's a multiplayer game that actually a few other CNCF projects are using it. Uh, and we started at Minikube, but the other projects are doing it. And basically this helps you to triage the issues more effectively uh, using a crowdsourcing technique. Uh, and there's a different categories of, of uh, triaging, for example, Let's say somebody uh, creates an issue in Minikube and say, oh, there's this problem with this. And I ask them for more information. And then two weeks later, they answer with more information. But that gets lost in 500 issues in Minikube uh, repo. Wouldn't it be nice that a tool would tell me that the person who you asked for more information now has more information. And that would be in a different category. That's one thing that we, we do it. We did in Minikube. Minikube, another uh, interesting thing that we did is we translated Minikube to multiple languages, and Minikube now speaks your language. Uh, so and you can wanna, if you want to add your own language to Minikube, it's super easy. It's a JSON file. Just translate the JSON to your own language. Currently, we have French, German, Spanish, Chinese, uh, French, and uh, Japanese, and Korean, and Polish. Uh, Another thing I'd like to touch in this uh, talk is the Minikube integration test. Uh, there is a challenge in Minikube integration test and the challenge it is we support many, many platforms and many, many runtimes and many, many drivers. Uh, and we also have legacy features that we do not want to break. Five years of user base features that if we break them, we break somebody. So those are the challenges. 
And we have different types of testing, unit testing, integration testing, Kubernetes performance test, pressure test, and translation test. Uh, currently, I do not know any other project in the uh, CNCF world that has as diverse uh, testing environment as Minikube. We get tested in GCP, Azure, AWS for ARM64, uh, Equinix bare metal, Mac Stadium, which are basically physical uh, Mac machines, and GitHub Actions, and also we have Alibaba in progress. Uh, and that's, I would say this is the most powerful part of Minikube, that we get tested in many, many uh, uh, locations and in many different drivers and runtime combinations. Another big challenge for Minikube was flaky tests. Uh, we have many, many tests, hundreds of tests, and in a PR you would see a, uh, a failure, and the failure would say this test is failing. So how would I know if this is a real failure that causing, is caused from this PR, or uh, how do I know if this is from uh, a flake test? So we actually built a tool that, uh, that measures the flakiness of a test and comments on the PR and tells you the, the flakiness. And that's also in our uh, website. You could check it out, the, the charts for Minikube uh, flake base. And this is based on a tool called Gopog. Gopog we built a tool for Golang that converts the integration test to HTML. But this has helped us to make the PR reviews much faster. You can see a, a, a test is a flake or not very quickly. Another thing that we have done in Minikube, we have created a Minikube bot that makes a lot of the PRs for us that we used to do by ourselves, like bumping the Golang, bumping the Kubernetes version, bumping this, bumping that. All of that is like done by a robot now. Uh, we don't have too much time. I think we actually ran out of time, uh, I believe. And I, I'm very amazed that you guys st stayed because I didn't pay attention that we ran out of time. Uh, but if you want, you can follow Minikube's um, Twitter. We have a Minikube bot called Minikube Dev that automatically pushes updates to Twitter uh, whenever there's a new Minikube release. So follow Minikube bots. And for future, we're gonna have VM driver for ARM64. We have ARM64 support for Docker driver, but, but not for VM driver yet. And we also have our plans for maybe uh, unifying the, the ISO and the container-based image. With that, thank you very much for staying. <laughs> uh, and I'll stay uh, for, if you have questions, I'll be more than happy. And sorry for running out of uh, way over time. <laughs>